Tara Ruda is a USA Today, Amazon Charts, and international best-selling multiple award-winning author of contemporary fiction that explores what goes on beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives. So oh, I love that. Her domestic suspense novels include Best Day Ever, The Favorite Daughter, All the Difference, and The Next Wife. Her next novel, Somebody's Home, is out January 18th. And here to talk about that and so much more is Kara Ruda. Kara, welcome to Uncorking a Story. Thanks, Mike. I'm happy to be here. So I always like to say that this is uh, Uncorking Story is about uncorking the stories behind the story. So I'm curious, where does your story as a writer and author begin? Third grade, Mike, in uh, <laughs> right outside Boston, Massachusetts. I, we, my dad was a professor at Harvard and we were living in Lincoln. And my teacher at the time asked us to write to the person who we wanted to become. And so I, of course, wrote to Robert McCloskey of Make Way for Ducklings. He was my favorite author and Blueberries for Sal. So I wrote him like, dear Mr. McCloskey, I want to be an author just like you someday. And he wrote me back and he said, well, you picked wrong. I'm an illustrator, not an author. So good luck to you, little Kara. So that was, you know, kind of indicative of how the whole publishing world works. I think it's like you know, highs and lows and <laughs> everything in yeah. between. So, yeah, so it was a straight trajectory from picking the wrong, you know, mentor to where I am now. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, it's, you, it's so funny you mentioned make room for ducklings. So we we have triplets at home. They're 19 now, actually closer to 20 than 19. But that was, you know, that book was, uh -huh. you know, on, you know, in the nursery, right? We read it all the time. So a few years ago, it was President's Day week and the kids had off of school. Um, we live in Connecticut and my wife and I are like, hey, why don't we take the kids up to Boston? Yeah. Um, well, we do that, but it's like the coldest, like snap, like Arctic, you know, thunders coming in. And I'm like, you know what, kids, we are going to do like, we're going to go like to, to, you know, what was the park where, where, where they wound up and make room Boston for Commons, yeah, Boston Commons, we're going to go to yeah. Boston Commons, we're going to walk through it, you're going to see the, the make room. They wanted nothing to do with it, because they were like penguins. I mean, they were just frozen to the course, we wound up just going to Newberry Comics and getting hot chocolate <laughs> somewhere. But I made my kids do the duck pilgrimage too. <laughs> Although we were there in the summer and it was like super sweaty hot. They're like, we don't care about the duck sculptures. I'm like, I care about, and I made them all line up. And yeah, it was very embarrassing for them. But yeah, we have four kids and they're used to it. So it's fine. Yeah, there you go. So it, it all starts in third grade. Um, so you're writing, that's that's a fascinating exercise, kind of writing a letter to who you want to become. I, I actually love that exercise. I do too. And I really, I talk about this teacher all the time and I cannot find her name anywhere. Like she's not with the school. And we moved in, when I was in fourth grade to um, Ohio, where my dad got a job at Ohio State. So I lost track of her, but she made such an impression on me, obviously, but I will find her someday. <laughs> someday yeah. I'll figure it out. yeah. It's so funny you did that. I, I tracked down a teacher um, about six years ago who, um, who was my fourth grade teacher. Um, yeah. nun, sister Dorothy Collins. Now up until this point in my life, I was scared to death of nuns. Um, cause we, we had, I grew up in Florida and, um, went to a school down there called St. Gregory's and sister Peter Marie, let's just say I was not her favorite student. Um, I would come home crying every day because of this woman and she scared the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> But I come to, so I come to fourth grade, new school, new town. Um, and this woman was just the nicest, kindest, you know, big heart. Um, and I tracked her down, um, I don't know, eight years ago. And I actually did one of these with her. Um, I mean, not an author, but I was just fascinated because she had a very interesting life story. Um, oh, yeah. But there is this thing about teachers that, you know, that, that they have such a, I mean, some of them have such a, an impact on our lives. They really do. And also librarians. So in fifth grade, my librarian, Mrs. Gardier, she um, laminated my first story and put it on the shelf in the library. And I, I mean, people could check it out. It was so amazing. And she, she was like that for so many people. And, and just, yeah, I, mean, I want to say like 10 years ago, we nominated her for the Golden Apple Award, which was the biggest award in the school district. And she won before she passed away, which is awesome. But, you know, librarians too, like just those in, you know, encounters with people who love reading and writing and words, and they can make such a huge difference at a young age. What was, so what was the story she laminated? Do you remember the title of it? Scooter and Skipper. Oh. 
Was it about a couple of dogs or what? No, no, it was two boys and um, they were twins and they, you know, always got into trouble and I, I, I illustrated it too. It's, it's a, it's a gripping tale. <laughs> did, did you send that to McCluskey? No, I didn't. <laughs> he would have said, yeah, like I told you, you picked wrong kid. <laughs> Keep trying. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. So, so the, the first laminated story. So when, when did you get it in your head that, you know, you wanted to do this for a living? Yeah. So I, um, I never, I, I didn't work for like the, uh, what, whatever that's the yearbook or anything in high school. And then when I went to college, I was an English lit major, not writing. I didn't really have the confidence to put a violin out there at that point. So I think I was just absorbing things. And I went to Vanderbilt in Nashville and it was still had some of these fabulous Southern lit professors who actually knew Walker Percy and knew like all the great people. And you'd sit in these lecture halls and just listen to the Southern accent bringing to life, you know, Faulkner and everything. It was, it was a great experience. But so I finally decided to, when I graduated, it was my first time I got a job writing and I was a researcher for Dallas magazine. I wanted to move to California, but the farthest I could get was Dallas. <laughs> All my friends at Vanderbilt came from Dallas. So there I was, and it was the roaring 80s with the Dallas and the big hair. And so I had a job as a researcher, but of course I couldn't pay my bills. So I also worked at an ad agency mm -hmm. as an intern. And literally every morning I just remember, and I, I had no air conditioning in my car, so I'd get there super early. And I'd sit in the parking lot of this at like big building where all the PR people worked and everyone had this fabulous clothes. I owned one suit, you know, so I'm like, <laughs> this is not working out very well for me. So anyway, I, I lasted a year in Dallas and I hightailed it back to Ohio to regroup. So yeah, but I did get my first byline there. Like I had, I did a roundup of ski resorts where Dallas people went. And so there, and I went to Ohio, got a job at business first, which was the business newspaper and that um, business chain around the country and ended up starting there, but we had a magazine insert. And so I started writing for the editor of the magazine as well. And that's, that's when I kind of um, found my love for longer form writing as opposed to just the news type. Well, so how, how long before, uh, you know, you start working on your first novel? Yeah, well, you know, then um, let's see. So then I went into marketing full time and I was working at ag ad agencies. I ended up the peak of my career in marketing. I was vice president of the first woman um, of Stanley Steamer Carpet Cleaning, vice president of marketing. Yeah, so this huge international, uh, not international, national job. And that was really fun for the most part. And then four kids too on yeah. top of that. So I didn't really, I had notions of writing but I didn't really have time to write I, I did like have a little corner in our bedroom right like had a desk and I would try to try to write things but didn't really all come together until after I left Stanley Steamer and had to file a little class action lawsuit and then I well, had well, no, time. you can't just you can't just you can't just glance over a class <laughs> have action lawsuit have some what? time on my hand uh you know gender discrimination sexual harassment that kind of stuff um, oh my gosh so then all of a sudden I found myself with a lot of time except for the reporters like hiding in our bushes and stuff but that that went away after a while so then um yeah that's when I started writing my first novel but at the same time, my husband decided to do a roll up of all these Ohio real estate companies. His family had been in real estate forever and he needed somebody to create a brand. So I came, we went back into work and we created um, Real Living Real Estate, which ended up becoming the fourth largest uh, brand in the country. And then we ended up selling it to Brookfield out of Canada. They bought the brand and that's when, <laughs> that's when I said, okay, but along that path, um, all of a sudden, someone asked me, well, what do you really like about real estate? And what I loved about it was working with all these, especially women entrepreneurs. It was one of the first careers where women can make as much as or more than um, sure. men. And my whole marketing career, I'd really been focused on marketing to women and acknowledging them as the consumer. So when I joined the real estate world, it would be all the imagery were like two guys shaking hands in front of a yard sign kind of stuff. So we were really the first national brand to target women as a consumer. And that was really fun to kind of change the paradigm, but also at the same time, teaching women real estate agents that their brand is their their biggest asset and how to put that brand into action in the world to differentiate and also build your business. So along that line, um, some the American Marketing Association asked me to write a pamphlet for them about putting your, you know, like the real you into your brand. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to do this outline, I might as well submit it. So I submitted it to an agent and a, a publisher on the same day they both called. 
Can you believe no that? that? Never happens. It doesn't work that way usually. Never happens. And so um, this agent, big agent from Boston, a woman named Helen, she she's like, don't talk to them until I talk to them. And so then my first book came out and it was published by Wiley and it was um, Real You Incorporated, Eight Essentials for Women Entrepreneurs. So thus I had a nonfiction book, which I never imagined <laughs> having. And all of a sudden what you find with a nonfiction book particularly is that you have to go speak about said book all over the place. Well, no, I've written everything I know in this. So then I had to hire a speech coach and like, <laughs> <laughs> go, go all across the country. But one of the times I was at this big conference in Austin, Texas, and like thousands of women in the audience. And I'm telling everybody, you know, you got to put your dreams into action. You got to, you know, whatever you're passionate about, that's your secret sauce. And I realized I was still not doing what I always wanted to do, which was writing that darn novel. So that's when we had moved to California by then the kids are all settled in and I sat down at my desk and I'm like, you know what, Karen, this is, this is what you always wanted to do. So do it. So I did. So that was 2011 and <laughs> well, 2010, 2011, my first uh, book came out, which was a women's fiction and loosely based on kind of the principles of really you incorporated. And so the woman in it's going through a midlife crisis. And so she has things to change list and it, it kind of, you know, like it's very inspirational yeah. in a women's fiction way. I mean, just but, listening to that, that, you know, ride that you just took me on from, you know, leaving, you know, Vanderbilt to, to your year in Dallas, to going back to Ohio to your career. I have to imagine that you have a car that has air conditioning now. I, you know, I do have a car with air conditioning now, but I don't really need it in Laguna Beach is awesome sauce. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, I probably went to a place that I didn't have to have air conditioning, <laughs> but yeah. Well, there you go. Well, you know, so that, that first, what did you learn about yourself when you were writing that first novel? You know, um, going for it's it's interesting because I have had always been surrounded by a lot of people. <laughs> I realized, you know, I have four kids. Um, we had a big business at one point. I had a hundred employees reporting up to me, and you know, so just a gaggle of of people. So when you sit down, I think especially for that first novel, maybe at, you're alone at your desk. I had my dog Oreo, but that was pretty much it. It's, you know, it's daunting and you have to be able to be comfortable with yourself. I think that's what you learn when you, when you do it the first time, maybe, and to trust your instincts and to, to let yourself have both the space to create too. Like I, I felt like, oh gosh, I should be, I, I've always been doing, I've always been working. I, you know, and, and it is working, but in a sense, it was just like selfishly finally for mm -hmm. me to, to sit down and do that. So I think saying it's okay because no one can tell what you're doing when you're just sitting at your desk by yourself for all those hours and, and months. And anyway, I guess letting yourself know that it's okay, that you deserve the time and the space to create. Yeah. yeah I'm also curious about you know, vulnerability, because, you know, if you're, if you're leading a, a team of a hundred people kind of rolling up into you and, you know, you're kind of, uh, you know, you, you're uh, trying to be a, a sort of a strong woman in the workplace and, yeah. you know, vulnerability, I imagine is tough in a workplace setting. Um, yeah, but it's kind of, cry. what's that? <laughs> you're not supposed to cry. <laughs> not supposed to I, cry. That's like my default when I'm angry. It's so, so unfortunate. Anyway, that's another story. But it's, but it's an important part, at least I found in any way of the writing process. So how do you, yeah. I mean, it, was there a, a tension there between sort of, you know, this corporate self and then the self that is trying to, to bring a piece of fiction into the world? No, I'd say the opposite. <laughs> Okay. I'm not a, I'm not a corporate person at heart. So yeah. I'm more of an entrepreneurial creative person. So trying to fit into that corporate mold was way more of a struggle than like the freedom of becoming what I've always wanted to become. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious about your uh, new novel, Somebody's Home. What can you share about this? I know, and I'm not good at so mysteries, as you probably know. If you say anything, you give the whole story away. So I usually just like read the back. <laughs> so here, these people who write the back cover copy, they say it so much better than I can. All right, so let's see. I'll just summarize. So okay, it's about Julie Jones. So it's set in Orange County, California, which if you've ever watched The Housewives or anything, you know we've got like a lot of extreme wealth. So Julie Jones, the main character, she is living in a oceanfront mansion. She has this very wealthy husband, but she's in a completely loveless marriage. She's from a small town in Florida. 
and she's reinvented herself through a lot of plastic surgery and other things to become this Orange County housewife. She has a young daughter, Jess, well, not young anymore, is high school senior. And she realized if she's going to get out and kind of make a real bond with her daughter, this is this is her last chance, really. So she has bought, unbeknownst to her husband, Roger, a new home across the tracks in another side of my made up Orange County town. It's a lovely home. It's just not like a McMansion that she's from and so when the when when it opens up julie and jess are driving much to jess's chagrin to their new home julie's all excited to make it a real home the only problem is the people who she bought it from had to leave town kind of quickly under a scandal he was a um, pastor of a mega church and oh yes doug doug was not um behaving well so doug and sandy and their kids had to leave the only problem is in the carriage house um is their 20 something son who's from his, doug's first marriage named tom and tom's only known this house this is his house and he has until sunday to pack up and leave but he has other plans he's gonna stick okay. around it sounds like yeah yeah so be careful who you leave in your carriage house you well you know you had me with pastor of mega church because yeah. it's just you know i i yeah. i you see uh like whenever i see joel Osteen, you know and i've never met him i i don't know much sure about him fine person. Yep. i'm sure he's fine but i used to tell the joke on stage um yeah because I, I i grew up catholic and um, I say, yeah, you know, a lot of people make fun of us and very easy to make fun of us Catholics. Um, and, and you laugh until you need an exorcist because, you know, <laughs> when you need an exorcist, you know, you call my people because Joel Osteen can't help you. Um, but uh, he's, um, you know, I just, he just had something in the news recently about, you know, $40,000 being found in like the wall of a, of a, you know, of a bathroom or something in the church or something crazy like that so why why why, why, why a mega church pastor for uh having to leave yeah. having to leave town quickly and um, the whole notion of somebody's home kind of popped into my head during that really dark time of the pandemic it, like the lockdown phase when it was like tiger king that kind of time yeah. um and i the to me the whole story sprung from the notion of okay we're all back home and it's supposed to be safe but what if it isn't right and uh, there's a lot of different threats to that and there's a lot of ways that people can pretend that they have the power to protect you right so i mean one can be um a, a, a mega church leader who believes he's become God, right? So this um, Doug almost becomes like in his mind, like he is the church, not that the God's the church. It's, right. it's his church. It's his uh, flock. So he has found himself, you know, I think just in this ego, he's also a big old narcissist. I have those a lot in my books. <laughs> so he, um, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's that guy. So he, he's become the church as opposed to being like the conduit to God, right? So he's just has this huge ego and he thinks his son's a loser. He treats him terribly. And so his son, because of that, and this whole notion of belonging, his son, Tom, who is, who is definitely the bad guy in the story, even the worst guy, he has, you know, he's kind of, he's without a, a father figure. He's, so he falls in to a different group that finds him at the bar where he's working. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, if you, if your father's rejected you, you might try to find belonging with some other guys and these guys are equally bad. So I have like really dark people in this story and yeah. And, you know, to, to, we were talking earlier about staying in your swim lane when you're, um, a suspense author like me, domestic suspense is what they call it. I am not supposed to put too much reality in it because I'm writing an escape. Right. So I had to be really careful because, you know, there's, there's a lot of undercurrents of, um, things that were going on and do go on in society in this and a little bit of white supremacy, a little bit of um, kind of the um, um, domestic terrorism that maybe yeah. Tom could be swept into if he, oh, you know, yeah. just that, yeah, kind of side. But 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 don't worry, it's not too scary. It not too scary. scary. He's not going <laughs> to wind up on uh, on January sixth wearing like shaman horns and with. Well, he could have, yeah, but he, he's not. He didn't travel, so he's here in the carriage house. <laughs> Oh, that's waiting, good. Keep him in that carriage other, house. Yeah, waiting for other things to happen. Yeah. So in, in domestic suspense, apparently they you only hurt the ones you love. So he can't like go blow up anything. He must stay in the carriage house. And trust me, he had those tendencies, but my yeah. editor's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> stay in your swim lane. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, editors have a very important job to do. 
They really do because I had been, my husband was in Congress and I sat in on all these hearings for um, about the threat of domestic terrorism. And really when you hear these experts speaking about it, you can't help but get it in your head and, and start seeing those signs around a lot. So that is where Tom sprang from, but I had to dial him back a little yeah. bit. Dial them back. Oh, I just love the the um sort of the, the, the genre of domestic suspense. Um and, and just, you know, you know, just seeing, you know, peeling back the onion a little bit on like like people who leave lead these like seemingly perfect lives. And and it's so interesting because I, you know, you go on social media and Facebook and you see like, you know, friends of yours who are posting like these beautiful pictures of the, them and their partner and their families, and you know that he's about to divorce this woman, um, you know, and it's like social media has become this thing where you could really put like this idealized version of yourself and your life on there. But, but the truth is, you know, quite different than what we see. Yes. Yes. Social media has made it. I mean, the keeping up with the Joneses has, you know, just gone into overdrive now and there's yeah. um, because you can completely hide be behind a facade. Yeah. And I, I worry about that for our kids, you know, um, oh who have grown up in this, this era, era, there's my, you know, Kennedy impersonation for you. <laughs> They've grown up in this era of, you know, seeing, you know, their lives documented, their friends' lives documented on social media. And you know that things are not always what they, what they seem to be. It sets these false expectations for our kids. It does. And, and in a weird way, like I have two, two of my four are in the creative world and my youngest is a singer songwriter and he hates social media, like his, his <laughs> with a passion, but to achieve what he wants to achieve in his business, like his manager's like, you got to get on TikTok. He's like, I don't want to be on TikTok, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it is, it's, it's also kind of a curse as well, because you know, he's like, what am I supposed to like show my, you know, cause that's, I mean, the way that people get fame is very, very unsettling and very superficial. So yeah, I'm like, poor Dylan. <laughs> I know, I know, but anybody yeah. in the creative field, I mean, you, you have friends who are comedians, um, they're working, uh, with a very famous comedian, um, uh, on a, on a podcast and they, they are like, we have to do TikTok in order to grow our listeners. And I'm like, yeah. I, you know, my, I know my kids are all over TikTok. They're, they watch it, they absorb it. I don't understand it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't envy. I don't envy. Like what happened to the good old days where you could just like go out there, produce great content, perform and build an audience organically right. that way. Now it's like. Right. Well, and he, he, poor guy, he's, you know, in his mid twenties, he signed his first deal with Sony. So excited, like moves to LA, gets his first apartment, signs with AWOL for his artistry. And then the pandemic hits no performance, oh. but no, you know, everything just stops. And it's, so there he is. <laughs> so really they're like, well, you just got to build your social media. I'm like alone in your apartment <laughs> in North oh. Hollywood. Yeah. It's tough. It's really tough. I, I actually felt for the 20 somethings the most during this, probably because I have four of them, but everything that you're just starting to gear up for your career and your life and everything just, yeah. Yep. Tough. Totally. Tough. Well, I have a, a, a series of questions here I call the hot seat. Um, these are, uh, you know, somewhat thought provoking, hopefully, um, but just let your gut um, sort of answer and uh, we'll see where they we'll see where they take us. So the first up is how do you feel when you're staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen? Excited. Mm, tell me more. Why? Why excited? Because I'm a pantser and I love the possibilities of a blank page and my agents are like, can you please start plotting just a little bit? So I'll write a whole book and then send it to them. That we didn't even know this was coming. Can you just give us an outline? So yeah, I love the possibility of a blank page. Does anything else in your life give you that, that same level of excitement? Um, I mean, I guess I've just always loved creating. So um, yeah, like the whole editing process, not fun. Like when I think about work, I think about a blank page and just say, that's exciting. <laughs> that's exciting. Like it's just full of possibilities. All right. Uh, number two, what lesson about writing or publishing do you feel like you had to learn the hard way? Well, I, I really believe life and publishing is all about resilience, right? So um, today we're blessed with all these different avenues to get a book published, whether it's, you know, self-publishing, indie, vanity, big, whatever. So I, I think 
the key to to all of that is is you always learn more from the bad experiences but you can't hold on to those you need to keep moving forward so I, you know and i've been published in every which way <laughs> and, and i just think the point to all of that is just to keep going keep writing what you want to write although if you do get a publisher stay in your swim lane is really important i found but yeah <laughs> or, or use a pseudonym or something right yeah yeah we're right yeah yeah um, yeah, the resilience, I think, is is key for I think I think authors need like two things in the core of their being. One is resilience, because you're going to deal with a lot of rejection. Um, you're you know, it's going to take and for some people um, it takes a very long time to find the right agent to work with um, or to really, you know, find their, you know, hit their stride, find their voice. Um, and the other is curiosity. You know, I think that curiosity is, is, you know, equally important, because if we're not curious about kind of the world around us, it's like. You know, um, anyway, that, that's what I found anyway. I think you're right. Yeah. And I think that's why being a former reporter or journalist helps too, because you're kind of in tune to like be listening for the story out in the world. Right. Yeah. yeah. You kind of see the world in a slightly different way, kind of looking for the, uh, looking for the narrative, so to speak. Yep. Uh, number three is what's the best piece of advice you would give to an aspiring author? Just, you know, it's the same thing. It would be just sit down and write and trust yourself to go ahead and write that story. And, you know, the, I think it's maybe the like second biggest dream or most common dream of people is to write a book. And I, so I hear this from people. I've got a great story. I'm like, well, go write it. Oh, you don't want to write it? No, I don't want to write it. I've got my stories. You go write your story. So I think that's number one is just to sit down and write it and get it finished. Whatever the first draft looks like, it's such a um, great feeling of accomplishment and then don't give up because the only way you don't make it to becoming a published author is if you give up. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure, I mean, have you ever battled with, with doubt, um, and, or, or kind of really thought of sort of throwing in the towel at any time during your journey? No, <laughs> no, right. because yeah, no, because this is what I've always wanted to do. Like I said, since third grade, so you can't throw in the towel in something that's always been your dream. Yeah. You just can't. I mean, you can, but why? No. So you have uh, had a very successful uh, career kind of before before becoming an author. I mean, you had a, a big career in marketing and advertising. Um, how do you celebrate your success? Or do you celebrate your success? Yeah, that's it's tough in a pandemic. This is my second pandemic book release, which is so odd to me. So The Next Wife came out during the pandemic last year and somebody's home is coming out during the pandemic now. And, and it's you know, I feel like the, the best feeling to me is going to the bookstore for your book lunch party. And, you, you know, you have people here, however many, and they all care about you and they're there supporting you. And you get to touch your book and sign it for people and talk about it a little bit. And I've always done every book lunch at Laguna Beach Books. And it's, you know, that's just what I've done. And now it's like, wah, wah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's Zoom. So it's, it's fine. It's just a little different. I have um, my book lunch for somebody's home is with the Huntington Beach library and the literary volunteers literacy volunteers which is super cool and so i'm like all excited for our saturday event and then they're like we're going virtual so it's, yeah so you know i so in other words i think it's easier to stop and celebrate when you actually have a physical event personally i feel like that but i am going to try to still celebrate even though i'll be here alone in my in my office with all these events and you know, I think it's it's the little things, right? It's like the five star reviews and trying to ignore the one star reviews. And it's like my friends saying, oh, my gosh, I love this one. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Those are the things to celebrate along the way as being an author. And someday again, having real life in-person events, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly can't wait for those. Um, all right. So imagine somebody you loved was having a bad day. What book would you choose to help cheer them up? Oh, out of any book? Any book, any one of yours or any book that you've ever read or familiar with? You know what I um, gave out as um, Christmas presents this year was The Boy, The Mole, The Horse. And have you read this? I have not, no. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm looking around because I have, I have, they must be downstairs. But it's just this 
sweet. Okay. It's mostly, it's like illustrations with, and you can read it in the middle. I think it's one of the top books of the year because it's just a story about kindness and mm -hmm. it's children can read it. Adults can read it. Whoever I gave it to like ordered like five copies for their friends. It's just this most, I think, especially right now, um, it just touches a nerve and I'm not even seeing the name of the book, right? But it's the boy, the mole. If you type it into any browser, you'll see. And it's, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's like the giving tree or a shell of Silverstein kind mm -hmm. of story only. Yeah. It just resonates right now. So that's, that's what I would give somebody if they were sad right now. Yeah. I always, you know, would get mad at the end of the giving tree. <laughs> a, know. Another one of those books that, that, you know, my son always liked to, to, I mean, every night when he was little, I had to read him like 30 stories, Harold and the Purple Crayon. Oh, um, you know, he loved the Madeline books and then the Giving Tree was there too. And I would always get so mad. I mean, as somebody who, you know, is kind of a giver by nature, I'm like, that tree is getting taken advantage of. <laughs> that tree is being manipulated by this she boy. She needs to stick up for herself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. You know, I, I want to see like an alternative version of the Giving Tree where the Giving Tree just like puts up boundaries. Takes him out. Yeah. Yeah, and it just puts up boundaries. <laughs> puts your little branches out and says, no more. I can't give anymore. I think yeah. the giving tree is dangerous. Um, yeah. Well, I don't really yeah. think that is. But it is giving. But did you ever read The Paper Bag Princess? That's another great one. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, someday after that, which is ironically also written by a man. But it was. it's really, it's an empowering princess story. <laughs> I yeah. read that to my daughter all the time. Mm -hmm. I am, um, but I, I love, I love ideas around kindness and, and joy. And um, it's, I think it's why, like I, during the pandemic, I got hooked on Ted Lasso. Um, I oh, just kind right. of, I got yeah. lassoed in, so to speak. Yeah. But, and then it's, you know, I just like, we, I'm like, I, I need more of this. Like, I mean, I, I was binging succession. I was binging all these stories about, you know, bad people doing bad things with really no redeemable characteristics. <laughs> And then yeah. all of a sudden, like Ted Lasso comes along and I'm like, oh, uh, I, it's I know. so nice, you know? Very redeeming, very Love nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so this one is a little bit deep, a little bit heavy, but uh, just kind of go with me here. Imagine you're, um, well, imagine you're at the end of your life and uh, you're kind of living your final moments. <laughs> when you look back on your life, um, what are you going to be most proud of? Oh, my family, for sure. My kids. Um and just, I don't know, just trying to be a good person and live a good life and raise people who are good in the world and, um, you know, tread lightly, but are kind. <laughs> so right. hopefully that. Yeah. I mean, family is the, the ultimate legacy, right? Yep. The ultimate legacy. Okay. So uh, last one, number seven, um, you know, imagine, imagine that third grader who, um, you know, was, uh, is, is still going to be looking for her, her third grade teacher, but, um, <laughs> You know, what words, if you could write that third grader a letter, I call this the Brad Paisley letter to me question because it was inspired by his song. But um, if you could write a letter to that third grader, what what um, words of advice would you give your younger self? You know, I, I, I would just say that, don't worry, everything's going to turn out okay. <laughs> All right. Did you have a lot of like worry and, and anxiety as a kid? Yeah, I think I, I, I'm definitely a worrier, definitely anxious. And we moved around a lot. So it was almost like a um, kind of an army existence when your dad's a professor. So I was born in uh, Evanston, Illinois, when he got his PhD in Northwestern. And then we moved to LA where he was at USC and my sister came along and then we were at UT Austin. And then we were in Boston for Harvard and then Ohio State. So I think when you have that kind of like, it's it's not bad, it's just a lot, right? You, you just feel kind of unsettled. So I think, yeah, I did have ang anxiety and just, so sense of place is really important to me when I write, my novels are very much centered on places I know that I feel really comfortable so my characters can roam around. Yeah, wow, wow. How do you think that all that moving around impacted your sort of your adult self? I mean, I think in one way it's a gift because you, I really feel comfortable with people from all different regions you know and then I went to college in the southeast so you know I, I think it's important to have that kind of experience to I mean it's really a, a gift to know, know your country like that and to have experienced that um yeah so I think it's flexibility I think it's um ability to 
change and grow. I mean, I moved my kids out to California from Ohio. They'd never moved before. And so all of a sudden they're like, boom, from Ohio to Malibu, mind you. And it was a big change. And they were, my middle son would not talk to me for like six months. He was just grumposaurus. And, and he ended up at, at spring break. We drove him up the coast to show him all of California. And my mom and dad are both from California. So I just have this love of it here and anyway and he's in the back headphones on computer on his lap and I'm like oh man is he ever going to talk to me and he ended up he's like mom I wrote a book I'm like okay <laughs> that's how he processed everything like the moving part and everything and so he did he wrote a book called teens happen about how you're supposed to communicate to teens appearance and, and and anyway he got it published and stuff it was it was really great so I think what happens is um when you do move it, it does, it takes you out of yourself. He was going to be big man on campus in this high yeah. school in uh, Ohio. And then all of a sudden he's like in this whole new space. So they are all glad that we moved now, but it is unsettling, but it's yeah. also about resilience. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, no, we did, we did the move. Uh, we, we lived in Connecticut and then 2014 had the opportunity to uh, run a department in, um, in LA. Uh, so we, we took the plunge. I moved the family out to Agora Hills, California. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it was a disaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It was an epic fail. And then a lot of, a lot of sort of stars aligned and we were back in the, the New York metro area within six months. Um, oh no. <laughs> but it worked, it actually worked out for the best because my mother-in-law was um, unbeknownst to us dying of cancer and there was a whole, uh, whole thing. So we were able to spend her, her final months uh, back, oh, uh, back with her. So, but um Anyway, listen, this has been a fun conversation. Sorry to end it on a downer about my mother-in-law dying. Yeah. Um, but Somebody's Home is out January 18th. So as we're recording this, that is next Tuesday. It is. Um, a big day, a big day. Um, big day. Anything else you want to share with uh, the, uh, the listeners of Uncorking Your Story? Well, you know, you can go ahead and pre-order it now. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There and you go. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, it's great being with you. I love talking about story from behind the story. It's it's really fun. Yeah. So thanks for having um, me. Well, if people did want to pre-order or order as they're listening to this, uh, where do you recommend that they go, Kara? Well, you know, your local bookstore needs you. So if you can order through them. Um, also, of course, Amazon is a always always there for you too but I, if you do have a local indie bookstore it's great to like pop in and support them as well and my other books are available there too so you don't have to wait you could start right in my first book best day ever in this area is uh, kind of my breakthrough book and it's really creepy so you could start there, there. You <laughs> there you go the best day ever reminds me of a spongebob song it um, does it does <laughs> or a scary domestic suspense novel by Kara Ruda yeah, one one or the other yeah uh, Kara, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike.